Um, good evening. My name is Martin Ludden. I'm the executive director at the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, and I am thrilled to have you all here. Uh, so on behalf of the staff here, uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. We are St. Paul's oldest community media center. We do a lot of stuff here, um, and I'm not going to go through the whole list, but we are a platform. We're about access, and we're about access to technology and access to a platform to tell stories. We're about raising voices. And I think one of the best ways there is to raise your voice is to vote. So thank you for being here to inform yourself. Thank you to our organizers and to our many candidates. Thank you all for being here. Um, and without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and yours, <laughs> the founder of the Theater of Public Policy, Mr. Tane Danger. Yay. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much for being here this evening. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I will say, uh, I'm. My name is Tane Danger. I am the host of a show called The Theater of Public Policy. Um, I am very excited for this evening, and not just because this is uh, a very important forum of some very important people, uh, one of whom is very likely to potentially be the next governor of Minnesota. But because tonight we're going to be talking about a set of issues that I don't think actually potentially get talked about as often in some of our uh, electoral processes uh, as they could be or as they might be. And so we're really going to be trying tonight to focus on some of these issues of voting and democracy and access and things like that. So yeah, that's good. So with that, I do want to take just a moment here at the very top uh, to thank uh, our organizing groups, the people who pulled this whole thing together. Um, so thank you so much to Fair Vote Minnesota, the ACLU of Minnesota, the Census Project, Common Cause Minnesota, MN Let People Vote Coalition, Take Action Minnesota, Minnesota Citizens for Clean Elections, and especially to Anastasia and Jean Massey, who have done so much work to put this thing together. Can we do a big round of applause for all of them? So, oh, all right. So how are we gonna do this? So I, um, I'm an improviser by training, and so I, <laughs> thank you one person. Uh, please talk to my mother after the show about that this was not a terrible decision. So um, so uh, I, I find the typical type of forum where we just ask a question, we go down the line and give each person two minutes to be deaf, even if there is liquor outside. So what, uh, what I'd much rather do is I do have some questions that were put together by our organizing groups, and I'm going to ask them, and I'm going to give candidates uh, an opportunity to jump in uh, as they feel sort of the, the spirit move them to do that. Um, we are going to limit them. We have a timekeeper here in the front to hopefully a minute or less. I will point out, and I imagine, I'm hoping this gets a round of applause, just because you have a whole minute doesn't mean you have to use a whole minute uh, for something. Um, and I might ask uh, follow-up questions to really try and, because I feel like my job here is to try and help us all figure out, you know, why this person and not that person? What is this person about uh, that is different that sets them apart than someone else on this stage? Um, uh, because I imagine all of us think that uh, these issues are very important, and so it's trying to make a decision about uh, who we think uh, we rank as potentially the best one. So uh, with that, I'm going to just uh, introduce each of the candidates um, and uh, you all are sitting in completely different order than I have written down, so uh, that's okay. So I'll try and I'll, I'll try and go right down the line. So please wait. A uh, uh, big round of applause, uh, Tina Liebling, right here next to me. Bob Carney, right here. Uh, Leslie Davis. Uh, James Everett, right there in the middle. Very smart choice, standing out with the, the color coordination, um, I will just say. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Chris Wright, uh, sorry, I skipped over one, sorry. Uh, Seymour, sorry, you're on my list here. Chris Seymour, Chris Seymour there. Uh, then I'm getting down to Chris Wright. Big round of applause, Chris Wright. Jenny Rhodes, right there. Tim Walls. And far away from me is Aaron Murphy. Hi, way down there. So, all right. 
So like I said, we've got a timekeeper here in the big, uh, front who's going to be trying to keep us to a minute. I've got the first question, which will is both a very broad question that hopefully gets uh, the spirit of this evening and hopefully it allows you all an opportunity to introduce yourselves. But So our first question for the evening is, uh, what do you see as the key challenges facing democracy in Minnesota, and why are you the person to address these challenges? And just, okay, Bob Carney wants to jump right in. So take it away, Mr. Carney. I, I'm Bob again, Carney Jr. And uh, running as a Republican, we'll talk about that later. Our biggest problem and our challenge today, both in Minnesota and the US, is that we are so divided. And we have a uh, what's called a two-party system. It's really two parties for the, uh, the financial interests. But when you look at voting, we need to think about what the ballot is and what voting is. And the way that I look at it, voting is speech. Voting is the speech of we the people telling the government who we want to be our elected public servants. And when you think about speech, you know, you want to be able to speak in a sentence. But our government, with the government ballot, censors us. They tell us... And it says uh, five minutes, sir? Oh, five seconds. Five okay. minutes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> they tell us after we list one name, they say, shut up. And we cannot speak in a full sentence. And that's what ranked choice voting is. And I'm going to be coming back to this because we have a right to, be, to speak and be heard. And the government cannot and must not censor us when we vote. All right. Uh, did I see a hand right there? Yes. Um. Christopher Seymour is my name. I am so thankful for Fair Vote Minnesota doing this um, because of the name of Fair Vote Minnesota. So to answer your question, what is the biggest problem I see and know, and you too? Money. Money is the problem. Okay, I am the most independent person on this platform right now because I'm not connected to any party. Is there anyone else on here that is not connected to a party? You're not? Not yet. not yet. So I'm not seeking um, any party endorsement anymore. I can't say that I haven't, okay? Um, but we know with parties come money. With money comes the ability to market. With the ability to market comes the ability to trick you comes the ability to get into your senses, comes the ability to control what you think through media, social media, television, books, print, and, and so on and so forth. They control votes. They control us through money. And I'm here to expose that and change that through okay. your vote. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Leslie Davis, I'm going to. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. The biggest problem facing politics and the DFL and the Republicans is fear. And you know, fear is like a fist, not a good tool. You could bang your head with it and so on, but so what we need to do in Minnesota is get rid of the fear and let all the tension go. And then a person like me, who's a fearless candidate, would have a chance. But with people's fear and anxiety, fear they'll be late for school, fear they won't get an A, fear they won't get their check on time, fear the renters do, fear they're overweight or underweight. Uh, so that's my main issue at this point. I've got my whole list of issues in my candidacy, but to conquer the fear is the most important thing. So you say to yourself, release the fear and let the tension go. And then you have a chance to vote for a candidate like me. Otherwise, you'll go for the same old party politics. Thank you. All right. Uh, so you're, you so far win in not taking up your full minute. Uh, so uh, I, did, were you grabbing a microphone there, sir? Is that what I'm seeing? I, That's, I was. All right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm Chris that. Wright. Uh, uh, campaign finance reform is, is the essential reform that without which uh, no other uh, reform is, is possible. Uh, if we don't, uh, if we don't begin to address this issue, and uh, let's face it, uh, gifts by lobbyists and uh, and special interests to candidates are bribes, and uh, we need to end this. We need to stop the revolving door that exists between staffers and candidates and so on. We need to uh, uh, we we need to basically. Uh, 
have citizen-owned elections. Of course, the Vikings uh, and the uh, uh, they <laughs> and Green Bay, for instance, the Vikings are a, are a, are a privately owned team, and they gave us. Uh, they said, "Well, we're going to leave if you don't give us corporate welfare." Well, they're not going to leave Green Bay, and uh, that's because they're a fan-owned team. I want citizen-owned elections. Okay, thank you so much. I did see uh, Tina Liebling here grabbing a microphone. Yeah, so. Good evening, everybody. Tina Liebling, state representative from Rochester and um, seventh term in the Minnesota House. So I think Chris Seymour said it, money in politics is obviously a huge issue. Look what happens when people go to Congress. They have to raise millions of dollars, and when they get to Congress, they spend a lot of their time raising money for the next election. So the cost of running in an election is obviously a big problem, and now with Citizens United, you know, Money has definitely become speech, and corporations are people. I mean, the things are just turned on their head. We have to get away from this. We need public financing. That is what we really ought to do. And the reason that I'm the right person for this is I have a campaign that's pretty low budget, I have to say, but the reason is I'm getting money from small donors, people who are giving me $27, the Bernie Sanders way, $10, $5. That's the way to do it, because believe it or not, we're all influenced by money. And if we take the money, the influence is there whether we think it is or not. Thank you so much. OK, down here, yes. Ms. Rhodes. Yes, um, I agree with Chris. And I agree with Aaron Murphy. Um, money Tina is. Tina Liebling, Tina. other side, I know. I'm sorry, Tina. Two redheads on both sides. We, <laughs> we set it up that way. Money is a big issue. I'm pushing the votes. And it needs to stop um, because money pushes the bias of the media. Um, when I go vote, I only hear part of a couple of the candidates, and I say, who's the next person? Who is this person? So you're kind of having to guess who you want to vote for. So it's the money and the bias it brings behind you know, the media, because the more money you bring in, the more you're likely to be notified in the papers, the news, and that's where I think it needs to change right there. And so let me just invite you, so why you, which is part of what we're trying to get at with this question. So uh, to give you a, another 30 seconds I'm here. also one that am using my own money to run my campaign. I'm not pushing out there. I'm not getting out big money from people. I'm out there pushing my own money and I believe in a smaller budget as well. We don't need all this money to be a governor. The one that wants to be a governor is the one that actually can do it with all that money because it makes them smarter, it makes them work harder, and instead of just having the money at your hand, it's easy. Um, I'm sorry, but I think hard work is the answer, and for me, I'm out there doing the hard work. Nobody else is doing it for me. All right, thank you so much, Jenny Rhodes. All right, uh, who? Are, okay, uh, Tim Walls. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm Tim Walls. I'm a public school teacher who ran for Congress in a uh, in a Republican district with a with a mortgage and a five year old, and uh, my wife was pregnant at the time. So this issue of money, uh, the idea that it costs three million dollars to run for a congressional seat, that's corruption with a small c. What we're doing is limiting our choices. My experience in 12 years in Congress is two things would fix the United States Congress: would be nonpartisan judicial or citizen redistricting and campaign finance reform. Because what it does is, and coming back to why I'm the person for Minnesota, is it reduces the opportunity for collaboration, cooperation, and compromises that are in the best interest of the state. And so when you run a campaign that has a message that can go further to people, that can bring people in, that can talk about inclusion in this, because what our job is, or how do you make it for Minnesota, the belief is is that we need to get folks engaged because they believe they can co-govern and make a difference in their life. That's how you get a new politics. So in the age of President Trump, the age of big money, the opportunity to engage more citizens in a real way is absolutely there. People want to see effectiveness in government. They want to see schools succeed. They want to see health care be affordable and available to all. And I think as governor, that's a message that uh, that I'd like to bring to them. Can All right, I, and can I yes. ask him a question? Oh, uh, we'll we'll get to more. I want to just I, I generally love this idea of asking each other questions, but I want to at least give everybody a chance to introduce themselves first. So let me do that, and then we'll get to that. Thanks, Tane, and thank you everybody for being here. My name is Erin Murphy, and I'm a registered nurse and a teacher. I'm a mom and a state legislator, and I'm running for governor. And I am delighted to be with you tonight. I will confess here at the start that I love politics and I have a lot of faith in us. 
and I am an evangelist, if you will, uh, for our democracy, the small D kind. You know, the Koch brothers, they love politics too, but not for the same reason, because they're using their outsized money and influence to hold on to the status quo, and the only thing that counters that is us. I have spent the last 12 years in the Minnesota House of Representatives uh, doing my job, but I've spent as much time on the doors and in the homes of people all over the state of Minnesota. And I learned in my very first race that if you want to know what makes people tick, you go to their doors and you learn. I have done that and organized all over the state, and I have watched what happens when 83 pieces of mail come to somebody's mailbox. Um, it turns people away from the election. And when we suppress the vote, our interests are suppressed as well. So money is the problem. Organizing is the answer. And the reason why I'm the right choice for this is because I've been an organizer <coughs> since I started working for the Minnesota Nurses Association 25 years ago. And I've continued to do that. And I will be organizing when I'm your next governor. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. How's it going? Check, check. Can you hear me? <laughs> I love it. Good. Yep. Um, I'm James Everett. I am the official representative of the Independence Party. Not endorsed yet, on my way to the endorsement. Um, I know people are like, who's James Everett? But that's me. Um, I'm, one of the, I'm from Minnesota, born in North Minneapolis. North side, representing. And um, you know how people say, you know, like Tupac says, the rose that grew from concrete. I'm more of a, like a wild orchid that grew in fresh soil from Minnesota. You know, I went portaging and kicking it in the boundary waters off Seagull Lake, and I was a Boy Scout. The reason why you should vote for me is because I understand that Minnesotans are individually smart and collectively stupid. <laughs> we work. We're so intelligent, we won't work together because we're so individually awesome. You can't even be racist in Minnesota without explaining why. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so so I, I, my, part of my campaign is eliminating racism and constructing healthy prejudice. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes it's not about your color. I just don't like your ways. You, we need to be able to Minnesotans to say, well, he did it for this or that. No, you suck because you don't pay back stuff. You, you remind me of my brother, and he looks like me. My point to you is, is that we as Minnesotans, we had full bellies, so we had a lot of time to think about a lot of things. It's time for us to work together. I'm here to bridge those gaps. All right. Thank you so much. All right, did you, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yes, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and any of the candidates who spoke on the same lines of Tim can ask this question, but something Tim said um, sparked a question of, it sounded like he was for fairness in elections. And so as a rebel and as an independent person, I would ask, and even as a teacher, because teachers do this daily, we give without thinking. And so as a teacher, I'm asking a fellow teacher, you know, Tim has raised the most money on this panel without being endorsed at all. He's got over a million so far, and I don't know how much is spent or not, but would you be willing to give a guy like me some money? I've only raised 20 bucks. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm not laughing. Is that what, well, I'm not yeah. laughing either. I, I've only raised $20. And I haven't spent enough money to actually file as a candidate yet, even though I announced August 2nd, 2016. So, well, let, I, let's, I, let's, I, let, no, let's would, let him would, answer the question. Yeah, yes. I would. I would answer on this. I would go back to that philosophy. I am willing to teach a man how to fish, um, I didn't if you ask will. That. I asked um, if you would. But I give say the, some idea, no, money. the idea of this, and I, I want to be clear about this because one of the issues is, is for all of us. I mean, the, the irony of it is, of someone who who came with no political background, no experience, no name, a mortgage, and having to run for Congress. If we lose these elections bad things happen. So what I did, and I think this idea that if you're successful going out, my campaign contributions also come from small donors. It's about talking, how do you build that coalition? Aaron talked about how do you organize? How do you get people involved? But I think Chris, his point is well taken on this. This is where I said campaign finance reform has to happen because it's corruption with the small c. There's wonderful people who should be in the United States Congress. They should be in the state house or in the governor's office, but the money is holding them back. That's why collectively all of us together talk about 
how do you raise money for candidates yes. who are doing it the right way? Okay, so I want to dig into some of the specifics of how we do some of this. But I actually, I do have a statement from one of the candidates who wasn't able to be here this evening. So uh, Rebecca Otto uh, sent this, and just since we've been sort of doing introductions, I'll read this very quickly. So thank you all for being at this important forum. I wish I could be in attendance, but I have an important family obligation tonight. I do want to briefly share my thoughts about critical issues that you'll be discussing this evening. I was an early supporter of ranked choice voting. I've supported implementing RCV at the municipal level, and I am open to the conversation about bringing it to state level elections. I'm a strong supporter of publicly financed elections. I signed the public subsidy agreement when I declared my run for governor, just as I've done each time I've run for elected office. Dark money currently has a stranglehold on our politics. I call this uh, the politics of greed. We need to end Citizens United and enact strong campaign finance reform laws. Again, thank you all for taking the time to be here. I wish you a lively discussion, uh, I bet. And, uh, and look forward to seeing you all out on the campaign trail. Rebecca Otto. So this brings me to what I wanted, what our second question for the evening is, which is um, uh, getting to the first uh, bullet point that um, Auditor Otto had in her statement there. So I'll read this as it's written. Our political system is becoming more gridlocked and unable to respond to the challenges facing our state. Ranked choice voting is a response to this problem because it requires candidates to reach beyond their base and campaign towards a majority of voters to win, and because it makes elections more competitive by leveling the playing field for more parties to participate. Would you agree with that statement, and if so, do you support RCV? Uh, can you expand on why you believe RCV is important and how you will help advance it at the local and state level? So there's a lot built in there. So I am going to try and uh, get us to focus in on some things. But yes, sir, you are raising your hand. Yes, tell us your thoughts. Um, one, I have supported ranked choice voting, um, and it's documented. Google me. My name is Christopher Seymour, S-E-Y-M-O-R-E. -E. You put that together with ranked choice voting on Facebook, and you'll find a picture with me holding a sign. Um, so I'm willing to do anything to decongest that gridlock, okay? Um, and that is why I'm running. And number two, I'm running because I believe I can be a good governor. And I also believe that I'm the best candidate on this, this table because of it. Um, if I was elected governor, that would be fairness. And so just to put a, you are saying uh, ranked choice voting statewide is something that you would support and push for as governor? Yes, it, it would do, and I'm gonna tell you the truth, as an independent candidate, it would do me good. I would love for all DFL candidates to run unendorsed. I would love for all GOP candidates to run unendorsed. That way we get them all on a ballot and we vote for all of them and then we get that ranked choice. I might be at the top. Okay, that's 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 very succinct. Thank you. Uh, uh, did I see? I uh, saw Aaron Murphy down uh, there. Yep. So uh, when I ran the very first time, I was in a field of five candidates uh, seeking the DFL endorsement. It was a very competitive race, and ranked choice voting was used as a test at that convention. And the results of ranked choice voting turned out the same as the results of the endorsing process, which gave me a lot of confidence. Jesse Mortensen, who was the Green Party candidate in that race, asked me to support ranked choice voting. And I did when we moved it in St. Paul. And we've been through a couple of elections now, and it's just working fine. So if it is legislated, and I'm the governor, I'll sign it into law. But let me also th say this, because we've seen uh, the threat of preemption in many ways, coming to the state legislature, preempting local units of government on raising the wage, on earn sick and safe, on uh, uh, saying something about smoking, something about gun safety. And I will not allow, and I will not sign efforts to preempt local units of government to move forward with ideas like this, because this is how we test it out and learn. Um, and it's a proof point that, that we can move statewide together. All right, so if the legislation comes to Erin Murphy, she signs it, yes, Bob Carney. Do you want to grab this microphone right there? Uh, Bob again, Carney, uh, Jr. And going back to the first point that I made, voting the ballot is speech. It is our speech to the government. And ranked choice voting lets us speak in a sentence. You can say, I prefer Tim Waltz first, and then uh, Tim Pawlenty's next, and then uh, Bob again, and, and go figure all that out. But the point is that 
everybody should be able to speak in a sentence. And the, the result of that is that you tend to have less division. People move toward the center because you can't get a majority if you are, are on one extreme. But with what we have now, you have this throw away your vote argument. You have two parties that are increasingly divided. That's a recipe for more division. But the key point we need to keep in mind is that ranked choice voting is both speech and it is a right. We can't ask the permission for the government to do this. We need to demand it. So, and so you're saying, just to put it, as I've been trying to put a button on all of these, yes, if it got to you, as if you were governor, you'd say yes statewide? Oh, absolutely. Is there it anything? Has to be done. Okay, okay, very good. So is there anybody up here that, just can I ask, that doesn't support ranked choice voting uh, going statewide that wouldn't, that would have any reservations about signing it if it came? Okay, we have one person, so I want to give Ms. Rhodes an opportunity. I would, because you're still pushing for the people that they hear of and that they know of. Um, yeah, you can do ranked choice voting, but what if I only heard of Tim or James or any or um, Tina? Um, that's only three candidates I've heard of. And then yet we got a whole bunch more that could be a great governor. If we don't hear about these people on the news, how do we know who's gonna be good? First, second, or third? That's why I don't agree on it, is because I may only heard of two people. So do I have to guess, like Trump and Hillary Clinton? I mean, that was not well, a good ideal sure. situation. I would make, I would get out there, and I would let the people choose, Minnesota people choose, not me. Um, I would want Minnesota to have something that they have a right to say if that's what they want. And I would get out to other, someone um, emailed me and asked me, <laughs> you know, should we go out to the other neighborhoods that, can I keep going for a second? Yeah, please finish your thoughts. Yeah, yes. I think we should go out to neighborhoods to let them know who we are. North Minneapolis, Saints of St. Paul, and the people who are became citizens, um, immigrants that became citizens, American citizens, they need to know who we are. They are part of us, so yes. unless they know who we are, I don't agree on it. So I, I know you're grabbing a microphone. I just want to try and get to, so to try and like sort out the, it seems like the tiers we have here. So it's, we have at least one person who says that they would hesitate to sign something or maybe not sign something if it was statewide. We have a few folks who have said, yes, absolutely, I would sign something. Uh, is there another shade in there? Or is there somewhere where more than just signing it, if it came to you, you would want to do something? And Tina Liebling had the microphone and then I'll come to you next, I promise. Right, well, I think that the point is that we want we want to increase choices for voters, and ultimately we want to increase participation. We want people to have something to vote for. And I think a lot of the time people don't vote because they don't feel like there's anything to vote for. And the system that we have has, has gotten us to that point where you get down to basically two major nominees and people look and say, well, there's nobody there that I feel like I can vote for. So I think ranked choice voting is a good idea. I like the fact that we're rolling it out in municipalities, that we're getting some experience with it. And where the shade of difference for me comes is I think we need more experience with it in more municipalities before we're ready to go statewide because we want people to have confidence and we want them to understand so that they feel really good participating in voting. I don't really think we're there yet but certainly if it got to my desk, I think we would probably have gone through more process before that would happen. And so at that point, yes, I would want to sign it. Okay, uh, Chris, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you, you, are, you were waiting, I believe. Uh, no, that's why I'm coming to you first here, yeah. I, I, I stopped him, I just came to you. When I saw this bow tie, I knew you were gonna be trouble. I, I knew it, you look too good not to act up, man. Oh no, I'm just messing with you. But. Um, I think, well, first of all, I was on the first ranked choice ballot in um, the history of Minneapolis and Minnesota. Um, so I, I, I'm a practitioner. I ran for mayor of the city of Minneapolis. Um, I would hesitate, I kind of, I agree that I would hesitate to roll it out statewide. Uh, we should go to counties first and go up the tiers and see what the effects are on that level. Um, there's a lot of decisions made. Um, some things can't be sustained in certain ways over eight years. I mean, you need eight years to do certain things just to lay out certain plans, especially when cities run in 20, 30, 40 year plans of development. Um, so I believe that, so with the ranked choice, I like more options, but in this situation, even though it would benefit me more, cause I'm like, a, you know, I'm cool. I can do a lot of different things. I can get to a lot of different people, but overall it's most important that we test it out first. 
So I benefited from it. I came in like nine, you know, um, in my votes for the city. Um, I spent $150 on my campaign. But um, yeah, yeah, I had a good time too. But I also <laughs> put some good policy that, you know, as long as you do it, I don't care if you, if, if you give me credit, just get the work done. All right, um, so we've got a whole batch of folks who are saying, if it gets to me, you know, if it works its way up the system, and so uh, now, Chris, you were gonna jump in, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm a little bit ambivalent about it myself. Uh, uh, it seems a little bit messy at, at times uh, with the rank choice uh, voting. But, uh, you know, if, I, if we added, uh, you know, and I think also the money back candidates are really gonna be the ones who are going to win anyway, because uh, no one's gonna vote for someone they've never heard of. Uh, that's just a fact of life, and uh, the ones who get, the, uh, get their name out there first and, uh, and, and uh, impress that on the minds of the voters are the ones who are gonna win. I would like to see, in addition to it, how about uh, a, uh, a choice for none of the above as well? <laughs> And uh, so does you know, that and if none of the above won, then we throw out those two and we start all over. So does that mean that if, just to try and pull out these differences, if a bill got to your desk that was, you know, statewide uh, ranked choice voting, you would veto it? No, I, I probably would sign it. I'm trying so hard to find some differences here. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> Leslie Davis, you were pulling a microphone close to you. Yeah, on the ranked choice voting, <clears throat> I'd like to discuss at some point taking it from four to three. I think four is very difficult to explain to that person that we're after, the one that's not involved and more of the disenfranchised voter. But it's a question of electing candidates as a question of ideas and trust. Who do you trust? You trust somebody more with the 34 record, uh, year record of environmental victories on behalf of the people on their own dime, not a nonprofit organization begging for money every time you open your email. And who has the ideas? You want to vote for a candidate that's going to continue to allow high fructose corn syrup to be peddled to children in the schools? You're going to allow these toxic dumps on almost every corner in Minneapolis that sell the worst food and the worst nutritional items in the history of mankind? You're going to continue to tax to pay for roads and bridges when there are alternatives? So I'm the guy you can trust. I've got the track record and for so, it. I, just to try and bring this back to ranked choice voting, so that is the, yes, but you are looking at it being three as opposed to four. 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 And I, we've, we're doing it different ways in different municipalities right now already, I believe. So here in St. Paul, you can do actually up to six, I believe. Um, so, But you're saying it should be capped at three if we did it uh, largely. Okay, um, we have at least a couple candidates who haven't jumped in on this, and I want to give you all a chance if you want to. I'm not going to force you to jump in on it. They good. Okay. I, I would like to say this, though. Okay. Real quickly. I'm, most of the people up here, I'm like, if when ranked choice voting, when I was talking to Raymond Dean and all them, they, you know, they were talking about it, I'm everybody's second choice. So that's a very different thing. I get along with everybody. Oh, I got a commitment to this person, or I got a commitment to that person. I've known these people and worked with these people, so ranked choice voting would benefit me. I just think that's so. Since we have a, we have like an extra two minutes. Uh, let me. So we already did everybody up here, and this is your chance. Uh, this is on the record. Like if you, if the bill got to your desk for ranked choice voting statewide right now, uh, Ms. Uh, Rhodes is the only one who said that she openly would say, "No, I'm not sure if I would sign that." Is there anybody right now who wants to say, "I would do more than just like sign the bill when it got to me"? If it were, I would be out. What, is somebody yelling at me? Uh, so is there somebody who's like, I'm going to do this beyond just the signing it. I want to push for it. So tell me how, Bob again, Carney. Ranked choice voting is progress. You know, this uh, two-party uh, system is back in the Stone Age. You drop one pebble in, one party color of the other party. Uh, ranked choice, at least we're speaking in a sentence. Now, we have representative democracy because how? we... How? I'm going to just... We have get limited here. time, here. but you have a minute. So I'm how would here. you do it? I'll just let me get here. Uh, <laughs> we uh, have representative democracy because we can't take the time to do direct democracy. So we elect people to be our representatives. We want them to do what we want done. So the next step beyond ranked choice voting is essay voting. Here's how this works. 
Here's how this works. You are allowed to write what you want the government to do in the form of an essay. And again, voting is speech. We need to get the government to listen to we the people as to what we want done. Now, we have the technology to start developing a system where people can go beyond, go beyond sentences, where our election is actually a process of listening to the ideas of we the people taking the best ones and implementing them. I tried so hard to get you to say how, but now we have another candidate Here's who is going to take a True, chance. can you turn the mic on? True campaign reform, OK? So up here. Again, I'm the only person that's not seeking party endorsement right now. So with true campaign reform, I'd go to these parties and stop all of the ability to collect millions of dollars before actual voting is even in the thoughts and minds of people. Because if we're not doing that, that's why Ms. Rhodes is saying no, because the ranked choice voting is already being done by he's first, she's second. She's third in the DFL party. He's last in the Republican party. He's first in the Independent party. She's second in the Independent party. I, he might be first before me as an independent sort of because of the marijuana thing. I'm last as an independent <laughs> because I'm the last one to be known. So if I, the reason why I'm here is to expose that these people are spending millions of dollars and you can probably not get none of them to say other than James and this young lady here and this man that they're going to run whether they're unendorsed or not with the big wigs. And I'm talking GOP and oh. DFL. If we can eliminate that mess, then ranked choice voting will would be 100% pure. That's how. He didn't want to speak. Yeah, no, well, let's hear it, so. <laughs> oh, they know me, they know that's not true. <laughs> so, no, and uh, the first thing I'd like to say about the ranked choice piece on this is, and especially all the folks who are actively engaged in this, thank you for the public service of engaging more people in this. This whole idea why we're here tonight is to increase participation in the democracy. We know what's happening on the other side fraudulent voter fraud things. Our problem is, is we need to make it easier for people to get to the polls. We need to vote on Saturday. We need to have a holiday. We need to make sure all those things happen. So with ranked choice voting, I, I certainly think it's the right way to go. I would agree with Aaron on the municipalities. I think some others, and Tina mentioned uh, about getting folks uh, educated on it. From a teacher perspective, what more can we do? I think it's talking to people about it, taking the fear away from them, telling that it is about choice. And I said one of the things that very much appeals to me, and I've heard people say it works to a certain degree and not in others, I love the idea that it makes you be pretty nice to others because uh, if, you're, if you're being nasty in a campaign, that's going to come back. Talk about yourself. Don't talk about others. So my commitment is, is if it gets to me, of course we will do it. But I think it's more about the teacher in me knows educating people about the okay. whole process of coming in. And the rank choice people have brought a lot of people into the process. Okay, so y yes, that was the, if it gets you, you would sign it. Yes, quickly, because I do have more questions. I just want to yes. underscore the niceness. You know, it was like gang banging before, like, you know, like Bloods and Crips with the Democrats, Republicans, or, or who are you going to support? Did they give you money? But like the ranked choice makes you have to kind of play musical chairs with each other, and everybody has to be nice, because it's not, not you don't me. have to pick one side. You get to meet other people, and you can build collaborations. Like, I'll be your two and all that. You can be my one, blah, blah, blah. It actually opens up to have the Minnesota nice all right. conversation. OK, so I should say, uh, the second half of the show, we will play musical chairs. So um, actually, though, uh, let's, let's, take a, let's take a deep breath, uh, and because we have a, a quick musical interlude, just a regular interlude, from Secretary of State Steve Simon is here uh, to say a few words. So let's hand him the mic. Thank you very much. I do not want to interrupt the action more than is absolutely necessary, because what they're saying tonight is a lot more important than what I'm going to say. So I'm going to make it quick. I want to thank Fair Vote Minnesota for putting on this forum. They have been an outstanding ally to me and to uh, many at the Capitol in fighting for democracy and expansion of democracy in the state, which is great. I also want to thank every single person on this stage. Don't they have guts for running for office? <laughs> Seriously. It is a big thing that they are doing. I know some of them better than others, but I have respect for anyone on this stage who's out here um, really opening themselves up to the public and to everyone in this room. Um, as Secretary of State, I like to say I'm in the democracy business, and what a time 
to be in the democracy business, am I right? Um, I think the important thing to know is that um, the enemy a lot of times in an election or the adversary isn't necessarily the other political party. It's not a Democrat or a Republican. Oftentimes, these days, it's cynicism. It's people, particularly young people, who are disillusioned, even disgusted by our politics. And I think if anything comes out of tonight and forums like this all over the state, whether it's for governor or any other office, yeah, this should give us all hope. You've got bright people from different affiliations, different parties who are here tonight who are asking for your vote, who are asking for your support, and that's a big thing. And you know, speaking of cynicism, it's easy, particularly for young people, but for everyone, to sort of shrug off elections and say, they don't matter, or they don't matter to me, or my vote doesn't count. And everyone has that impulse from time to time to just skip it, to kind of uh, not participate in a particular election, whether it's state, federal, local, it doesn't matter. And I guess what I say, and I'm not so worried about people in this room, but generally the people who may be watching on the uptake or, 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 or elsewhere, um, resist that impulse. Uh, I can't put it any better than the words I saw a few years ago on a t-shirt. And the t-shirt said, failure to vote is not an act of rebellion, it's an act of surrender. And I think what Fair Vote stands for, and what everyone on this stage here, on, the, on, on this dais stands for, is using your vote, our vote is our voice, and again, I just go back to these great candidates up here who are putting themselves out here, not for their own health, because they want to move Minnesota forward in their own way uh, and, and in different ways that they might articulate. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for Fair Vote for putting this on. Now back to the people you really want and need to hear from, and that is the noble candidates on this stage. Thank you very much. Come back for the 10 o'clock show. He does a musical number. So. Um, all right, so we've talked actually a lot already about uh, money and politics has come up several times already. And so we do have a question here, and I'm going to read it, but I'm going to try and put a point on it, which is the question uh, that was submitted was, why do you see, uh, uh, what do you see as the problems with money in our election? And how would you address these problems as governor? Because we have already had several folks point out the uh, significant problems they see with uh, the money in elections and campaigns and politics generally, I really am going to encourage strongly for you to focus on that second half. What is it that you would do? What is it that you even can do as a governor that would try and change some of those types of things? So you, sir, uh, were ready to go. So take it away. I am going to always grab this microphone first because after I speak, they're all going to be like, he's right. That's what we should do. That's why I'm running for governor because I'm right. This is what we should do. Um, we have to, I'm, I'm, I'm finna go way back, way back. I'm gonna say it one more time, way back. The Republicans and the Democrats are the ones who were in civil war. We're in treaty. No one is bold enough to tell you this in the United States who wants to be a politician. We're in treaty between the two. That's why we use the words liberal conservative, Republican, Democrat. What I would do as a governor every day as an independent human is to convince the people. We need to eliminate that foolishness throughout our laws. We have Republicans suing a Democratic governor, not humans suing a human. And they stand and they say, we, my man Tim just said tonight, we can't afford to lose another election. Who is we? The people behind him. He's not running as an independent. I heard him say, speak on yourself. But you can Google me, S-E-Y-M-O-R-E, -E, and you'll find me. But I have to speak on what's here because this is what's been holding us back. This is the problem. Okay. No change. Okay. Uh Thank you. Uh, Leslie Davis, you were jumping in there. The cornerstone of my campaign for the last eight years has been the Davis money plan. Now, when you talk to the legislators, they don't know where money comes from and how it comes into circulation. Matter of fact, 99.9% .9 of the people don't know where money comes from and how it comes into circulation. I do. I have two of the top experts in the field in Minnesota advising me in my campaign. And we would bring money into circulation as wealth, not debt, to build all our roads and bridges and take off all the gasoline, axle, 
and uh, sales taxes. And we'd have state-of-the-art roads and bridges in Minnesota. It would help the environment. We'd create thousands of jobs along the way. So we understand where money comes from and how it comes into circulation. And I don't care who becomes uh, in office. I'm running for office because there's nobody out there with an idea, with a plan to stop the fluoridation of our public water supplies, or how to build roads and bridges without taxes or borrowing. OK. Um, Tina Liebling is? So, but, but I'm stand yeah, up. good. Yeah. OK, short people have to stand up. So, <laughs> so uh, the question was, what can we do? Yes. Uh, and what can we do? There are a number of things that we can do, because even though Minnesota is better than a lot of places, we have a lot of challenges. So one of the things we need to do is the legislative caucuses. Do you know that even though candidates are limited in how much they can accept and how much they can spend, usually, the legislative caucuses are not. And so a lot of money flows to our legislature, to the House Democrats, Senate Democrats. That's who I mean by the caucuses, Republican Democrats, Republican uh, senators. So they are taking a lot of money from special interest groups, and it shapes what happens. And members of the legislature may not even know that. So it's a really tough thing to do, but we ought to cut off that flow of money so that that isn't happening behind the scenes. There are a lot of other things we need to do. One is stop the revolving door where legislators can leave the legislature and go and become a lobbyist right away, and staff, too. And I've had legislation to try to do that. And make legislators tell people who is paying for their junkets. Legislators can go on junkets, and they don't have to report it at all. We need to close a lot. Of, there's a lot more things, but it's too much, and my time is up. But It is, but you gave us some yeah. really uh, particular things to chew on here. So um, this uh, question of disclosure of things like junkets and the question of a bill to actually uh, make it so that a uh, former legislator and or a staff, was it a period of time, your legislation, or was it permanent that they could, it was a period of time, no, a period of time, a period of time. so that they don't just, you know, so that you can't be get offered a fancy job while you're in this position, and then, you know, so it's a it's a corruption thing. Is that something uh, everybody up here would support that kind of legislation? Is there anybody up here who would not support that kind of legislation? Ms. Rhodes, you're winning on my, like, trying to sort people out. So uh, I, I'm going to, uh, Mr. Walls, if it's all right, I'm going to give Ms. Rhodes a chance to respond, and then I'll go to you, because I know you were grabbing a microphone there. Um, Do you want to grab your microphone there first? Um, you know, I don't agree on that, because right now, everybody knows who Tim Walt is. Um, actually, I didn't know who you were until this year. Um, <laughs> no offense. <laughs> but I did. And... <laughs> but I think the important thing is is that there was an election a few years ago where there was two top, a Democratic and a Republican. And the news came along, and there was one of them that was ahead of the polls on both of them. He was an independent. But the news crew didn't want to report that. He was forgotten. So if you Minnesota people knew about this third person that was ahead of the polls, then he would have been known. I'm saying that all everybody should be put out there. And that's where it so needs to be fair. I, I, I understand that piece. I'm just trying to get this particular. So if, a, if legislation, as you as governor, came to your desk that was, there's a five-year ban on legislators and or staff going into lobbying after they've been there, that's something that you would not support. You know, that was something I'd have to look in a little bit more. Um, Okay. You know, that I'm not, I, I'll be quite honest, I'm not up to date on that much, but sure. I think if they go down to a different job, I think it'd be fine. It's what they're doing. I'm okay. not going to say no, but I'm not going to say yes right now either. So I, I will come to you next, but I did promise uh, Congressman Walls uh, a chance to get in here, but then, no, you can take the microphone because you can go next. Yes, so. Well, I, I agree with Tina. I authored it in, in Congress back in 2007, no trips, no meals, no anything, and then the ban on being able to use the revolving door. I agree with Tina. Much like the money in politics asking about it is, it goes back to this idea again. It, it, it breeds cynicism and it reduces our choices. This idea that, again, if it's a direct correlation, people are taking 
spending money and voting accordingly. Uh, yes, that happens. But even if that doesn't happen, the public believes it there. So one of the things that I did and I would do as governor is build the coalition necessary. I passed something called the Stock Act, Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge. Members of Congress could trade using the speech and debate clause of the Constitution in stocks. And lo and behold, they outperformed the market by 6% year in and year out. Either we had the most intelligent people in the world or they had insider knowledge. And what I believed was is that undermines people's trust in the system. That's what this all comes down to, disclosure, knowing what's coming from what's there. We passed that Stock Act. That's how we just got rid of the CDC director who was trading tobacco stock. That's how we got rid of the Health and Human Services director for doing that. What it's meant to do is not that I believe all my colleagues are corrupt, but all of you believe they are. So one of the things that you do is you bring the disclosure, you pass legislation like that, you build that to restore trust in the system. We can do that right here in Minnesota, and Bettina's right. You have to believe that people are in it for the people, not for a career stepping stone. Okay, I'm seeing a little bit of fighting over microphones, so I wanna, I gotta give people a chance here. So yes, sir. Um, I wanna answer the question that you asked. Does anybody, would? not do that. So as an African-American man, I, I, I know how hard it is when someone tells you you can't do something when you very well are qualified to do. So I understand what he means by in, in the stock world, in the corporate world, um, but it's hard to write a law to say this man can't have a job even though he's qualified. Let's make it three months from now. So that's why he asked you, would it be indefinite? that he can't do that, or would it be in a time period? So if it's in a time period, that's your bias. It's not the public's bias, and you're writing a law that will set up more biases and discrimination towards people, because we all know when, it's, when something goes to the Supreme Court, it's hard to change that when it's found. So you're saying probably I, not? Probably, no, I no, would not. absolutely not. Absolutely right. not. Uh, James Everett was uh, up here, and then we'll go to Bob again, Carney, and then all the way back Chris there. was yeah. next. Oh, I'm sorry. Was Chris? I couldn't see. Chris wasn't waving at me hard enough. Um, um, That's what we were fighting for. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, what Tina Liebling said was uh, uh, well taken there. We need to stop the uh, and the uh, revolving door. I would put a lifetime ban on that uh, for... Uh, for legislators or their staff, and uh, uh, you know, I, I just watched a show. It was uh, called uh, Casino Jack about Jack a Abramoff, uh, the great uh, lobbyist. Who, uh, you know, he uh, he knew that uh, when he offered a job to the staffer, that uh, once they accepted, even though they weren't even working for him, he knew that he had them in their pocket already. We got to stop this uh, from happening. We know these, uh, this is a, a very corrupt uh, situation. And uh, I, I would add, well, I guess I'm not going to add any. OK. Uh, don't worry. We have more questions. But James, did you want to jump in? I want to address this from a different angle. Um, Independence Party, the reason why that's important is because we have to have a way to protest with our votes. I'm a, I'm a Generation X, so I'm right there in the middle of the Xs, and I, I was raised by boomers, and sprinkles are for winners. People need to, if you can raise more money, you should be able to do such. Mind you, the super PAC stuff has never been a part of the Independence Party. So we have to learn that that's more of, that's more of the issue is, is that we have to be willing to protest with our feet. I hear people see a small D and a big D or whatever. Um, the farm and labor... And, and all of that stuff, the interest, everybody wants to close the door now that they're leaving. Now that the baby boomers are retiring, now they want to legalize marijuana. Now that everybody's done, went on all the trips, they want to make sure everybody next stops all the trips. My point to you is, is that it has to be done with reason and you have to ask yourself, what is that reason? But the third party has won in this state before. And it's important to stop picking poisons and saying that you're not a part of it. You know that big money is going to be a part of both parties. Are we serious? There's not even a, there's only a D. There's no FL. Thank you. There's no FL. The farms have been corporately sold and the labor has been outsourced. So I'm just saying, right. let's be honest, y'all, about it. No disrespect to the candidates, sure. but let's be honest about what your real options are. Okay. Uh, so I, I know we've got... Uh Bob here, and then Aaron all at the end. And I will just, as a reminder, we are sort of trying to get a sense of supporting or not supporting this idea of banning uh, for some amount of time or lifetime, as we heard one candidate say, uh, 
uh, staff and or legislators from going into lobbying. Also, disclosure of who is paying for some of these trips and things like that. So, Mr. Carney. Going back a bit, the question was, what can Minnesota do about the problem of campaign finance? And this question about banning lobbyists for a period of time was a derivative from that. Correct. I want to go back to the uh, main question and talk, uh, and this is really educational. It's not as much uh, my political issue as it is letting people know about a program that we have in Minnesota, and that is the political contribution refund. It's the only one in the country. And so we have a program where if, if a person contributes $50 or a married couple $100 to a qualifying state party or state candidate, then you get a refund. And the theory is you can't live in Minnesota for a year without paying $100 in taxes. You just can't do it. From vending machines and sales tax, wherever it is, you're uh, paying uh, property tax if you pay rent. Uh, so the idea is that if you make this contribution, then you get a refund from the government. It started out as your money, the government collected it, and it's coming back to you. We can do that at the federal level also. But we've got this going. I was the first person to sue Polanyi when he unallotted it. But okay. we need to fight for this program and use it. And people need to know more about it. So this is, that is a very point well taken, and thank you for answering the initial question. Just to get you on the record with this other piece, how do you feel, uh, and we're out of time, so I'm going to ask sort of for a yes or no, uh, ban on lobbyists uh, lobbying after serving a term in to, office? To the greatest extent possible, I think both staff and elected officials ought to do that, uh, be, be required to do that. You may have to have a period where people are given notice that that's the terms they're getting into. Sure. But uh, uh, outside of that, it has to stop. All right. Okay. Down there, uh, Representative Murphy. Uh, we took up the issue of uh, disclosure of dark money back in 2013 or 14, uh, when we were the Democrats in charge. And we had uh, talked about the issue, Ryan Winkler, I think, carried the legislation, and there were two special interest groups that said no, um, the NRA and the Minnesota Citizens Concerned for Life. And that was enough for members of our caucus to say, no, we don't want to vote on that disclosure. That's the power of money. And those two groups then weighed in in that election, and they unelected a number of people who weren't willing right, to vote for that disclosure. So we need to make that dark money transparent. Just like I have to report the money that I raise um, into the campaign, that money needs to be disclosed as well. That we have to do here in the state of Minnesota. Two, I think that it's important that we expand public financing, the PCR, as Mr. Davis was talking about, and let uh, the, our tax dollars um, be used to be able to finance our campaigns um, more significantly than they are now to take uh, the power of money out of the elections. I think that it's important for us to use an independent body to draw the districts from which we are elected, because that will be more okay. fair than that legislative process. So you're pre And last but not yep. least, yep. Um, as the governor, I'm going to continue to do what I have been doing now for 12 years, spending my time with the people of Minnesota and organizing those voices, because I think that is the counter to the cynicism and the gridlock that's happening in the Capitol. And okay. when Minnesotans' voices are brought into the Capitol, okay. and I'm with the people of Minnesota, organizing that and speaking on behalf of the things that I think are important, we make progress. It's good. I'm with the timekeeper, so I got to do that too. So just to try and put a button back on this. So uh, we, we have Representative Liebling's bill on the floor here of uh, banning lobbyists for a period of time, uh, banning lobbying for a period of time. Yay. I would, support, I would support a short window of time, no more than a year. And I will tell you, I recognize some people in this room who are lobbyists. Um, and they are good and decent people, many of them citizen lobbyists. So I don't want to besmirch those reputations. So yes, a cooling off period between the end of your service as an elected official and entering into the profession of lobbying, but not a lifetime ban. What does a okay. year do when the laws don't change? What's well, the purpose I of I mean, I year? think she's talking about a law that would be a year. That's what I'm asking. So if it's only a year, there is no difference. So, but you, so, uh, so you're saying don't do it at all, then? 
if you're going to do it, it's, it needs to be lifetime. My thing is, if it's a year, that's just stopping me from getting a job for the next year. It, it does no good. So if you're going to do it for the reason of information right. sharing okay. or this guy knows the bill that's coming two years from now, you know what I'm saying? Because sometimes yeah. it takes a couple of years for the bills to go through. So then even a year would not help. So if I had to, if it was on my desk, yeah. I would re re give it back to the people and say, well, give me something to choose from. So it seems like you're saying, uh, uh, Doing it for a year is the worst. Doing it for a lifetime is slightly bad. And I then say, not doing it all I is the least worst. I say doing it worst. for a year, there's a motive there. Okay. There's a motive. Not for leaving it alone for a lifetime, there's no motive at all. That's clean so, and 100% pure. So I'm going to do a dramatic cross across the dais because I have been standing on that side and I worry that I'm biasing uh, that side of the room. So look at, <laughs> now I'm over here and now I'm look, looking at both sides. So I'm totally going to shift gears here to a, total, a very different uh, electoral issue, but uh, something uh, I think is, a lot of folks here will be interested in. So. Currently, there are 48,000 or more voters who cannot vote due to their criminal record in Minnesota. Uh, as governor, they're not applauding for the fact that they can't vote. No, they're, uh, they're applauding for the question. Um, as governor, would you prioritize restoring voting rights for these citizens? If so, how would you approach it? You're standing already, so, I, so yeah, go, go. Thank you for this platform. Um, the answer is yes. I would, again, it's the same thing. What, what difference does a year make? So if I'm a felon, and I'm a felon because I sold 10 pounds of weed, okay? And, yeah, 10 pounds of weed. That's, that, that's, 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 that's still federal charge, though, right? And so, and then this, no, then this guy becomes governor, right? And then I legalize marijuana, right? And then the law didn't change of do felons get to vote or not, but the marijuana did. What makes me less of a human now? What makes me more of a human because I'm a governor? So my thing is it's wrong to stop felons from voting because they're still citizens. Now, when they become uncitizens is when they commit another crime that takes them out of the citizenship realm. Then you can't vote in prison. Okay. But if you're standing outside of prison, I don't care if it's the very day. If a man gets out on November 6th, he should be able to vote on November 6th, because what do we say? You paid your debt to society. Okay. Very succinct answer there at the end. So, uh, yes, did, did you want to go ahead? Yeah. I agree. Um, I think once you're out of prison, you served your time. Um, if you're in prison, no. Um, you should not be able to vote. Your rights are taken away for a reason. But once you walk out that door and you can go vote that day, you have every right. And if you have three felons on your record, they should still be able to vote because they're out of prison. And now it, whatever laws they're out into now pertains to them, and they also should have that right to vote. The, so, I, Representative Walls is, has a hand, and then I, I see you, sir, and so, yes. No, I agree. Chris was right on this. I think all of us are restoring the vote. I think all of us recognize in this room, too, that, uh, that this piece of legislation that prohibits them from voting uh, disenfranchises people of color and indigenous people at a rate way above. And, and this idea of how... How are we supposed to ask somebody to recommit to their communities? This is the fundamental piece, and it's where many folks find their redemption of coming back in and being a part of that. I think it's a commitment here in Minnesota, making sure the legislature passes that. As your governor, I'll sign it. But I think it's most important, once again, the role of governor is to be able to go out there and take our message. We talked about ranked choice voting expanding us beyond our base. A lot of times, uh, that's what we're not doing. We're not taking a message to all corners of states, to all people, about why this is so important to bring people back in this so uh, I agree with my uh, my friends up here that that's exactly what we should do and and we should continue to push it this is something that we can make happen uh, right away and we should all right mr. Seymour yes James um, I don't I just uh, I just can't feel it though you know what I'm saying can y'all hear me yeah. I got to you know me you obviously know me um, my thing is, is that the mechanisms that come into 
the piece here. For instance, the money that only comes down for get out to vote if you're voting for Democrats. When they fill the van up and they get us through the neighborhood and say, come on, come on. That part oh, right sorry. there. I, I'm just being told for the folks watching on I'm TV, sorry. they can't hear you. Okay. Is this thing on? All right. Here we go. So check it out. The mechanisms, we start that number over on me, okay? Okay, all right. The mechanisms that come with it that every nonprofit turns into a, almost a little baby DFL hub. The fact that the Republicans know they don't have to show up because we're gonna have liberal enough views and they know that they have their base already solid. The fact that the black vote is used to get people like Mark Dayton in, which I love, I think he's like Bruce Wayne, like Batman and everything, he's awesome. But um, the, the fact that the black vote was used, those 300 votes got him in, but yet when we lose, we get attacked by the conservative side as well. Um, the, citizen, the citizen stuff, like, I think when you come back from, I, I didn't go to jail. I chose some different decisions. I understand people have different situations. I saw a lot of people making decisions that got them there. In, in our neighborhood, it's not that hard for it to happen. But on the opposite side, the, I believe you should have to take a citizen's class, citizenship class. I believe, when I was born, when I was, excuse me, I was born here, but I was raised in Texas, we had to sing the national anthem every morning. We got to get people to reinvest in patriotism. We've got to get people to understand what their citizens' rights were. Most people didn't know they had power. That's how they went to jail. We need them to get out and realize that your vote is your power. Can I just, if we had a citizenship test, what would be the penalty for failing the citizenship no test? No citizenship. Um, no, we shouldn't have No, I'm saying no, no, there's no penalty. No penalty. The point is, do you know what, that we are in a republic? It's right. not a democracy. Do you understand that the, do you understand your vote? Huh? Well, that, uh, it can be dictated to them. I don't care if it's done in a pictograph or Pictionary. The point is, is that we need to make sure that they understand the power of their vote. In Minneapolis, a strong city council, weak mayor system, you need to know that. You need to understand how your votes impact the city yes. if the person becomes city council president. You need to know that to actualize. Otherwise, Democrats know that, they, that all the felons will come out and vote for them because they have all these hubs for everybody to go to. We need to make sure that people have a pure option. There's never any money that comes bipartisanly for get out to vote. It's only attached loosely to campaigns and party individually. There's never any bipartisan bill for the money to come down to the people to actually engage them. Okay, Chris, uh, right, had his hand up, yes. Yeah, well, you know, in, in a lot of uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, politicians go into the prison and they campaign because they have a right to vote even in prison. So I would agree with that myself. So you would say, uh, going a step farther than what we've heard from some of these other candidates, yeah. is uh, allowing, uh, you never are disenfranchised. You keep your right to vote even in prison. Well, I mean, uh, you, you, got your, you got your rights taken away. Uh, shouldn't you be able to vote on, uh, on, on other things while you're in prison? So things that affect you. All right. Uh, I want to give our, our remaining candidates a chance to weigh in on this, so... Okay, yes, Aaron Murphy, please. Well, absolutely, uh, we have to restore the vote, and I like that idea that you're talking about. Um, I remember, and, and this has happened to me more than one time now, uh, being on the doors and encountering somebody who wasn't clear about whether or not they could vote um, after their period of incarceration. And when you've served your time, you should be able to vote, and for me, the vote is sacred. Um, so everyone should have access to that right. Uh, we also know that recidivism rates, if this is important to anybody, and it is to me, and I'm sure it is to you, those rates are lower when people are engaged in their community after incarceration. Voting is a measure of community engagement. So uh, for many, many reasons, a justice reason primarily, but for many reasons, I think it is important that we move on this, and I'm an active participant in making sure that that happens. I, uh, I'm gonna go to... Tina Liebling. Well, so I'm a criminal defense lawyer by profession, and I absolutely agree uh, that the vote should not be taken away unless that's actually your sentence. And, and most of the time, it isn't. And so I agree that it would be, we really should try to figure out ways to let people vote even while they are incarcerated. But there's some practical problems for that, you know, especially because they don't necessarily live in the place that they're incarcerated and people get, so that would be a little bit difficult. But one thing I just stood up to say is that I think somebody implied here that felons would all vote for DFLers if they could. You know, that's something that Republicans tend to say, and it's one of the reasons I think that they're so reluctant 
to expand the vote and let people vote because they imagine that it's going to go one way or another. I do not think there's any evidence for that. And even if there was, it is not a good enough reason to stop people from having what should be the basic right of a citizen, and that is to help choose your leaders. All right, can I, I'll give you 30 seconds to respond, just because I did promise Bob he could go. Yeah, so I please. said that because I have a lot of DFL friends. I got a lot of Republican friends. I didn't want to go into names on live stuff and go that direction. But it is a certain a part of who got incarcerated. I mean, there was a reparations document created by Hennepin County called the African American Men Project Compendium because of the disparities of how many African Americans have been picked up, pulled over for traffic stops, 2,000 something against 161 white men, so they gave everyone back their license. So we know who's being incarcerated. That's not the question. And what neighborhoods do they live in? And all of our cities are, the Minneapolis is democratically run, but yet has the highest disparities in the country. 60% of people that are on probation that would benefit from the right to vote are in outstate Minnesota. And the, 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 the studies have shown that people vote for where they live. Um, so I, just because the folks can't hear you, so she was saying 60% um, of folks on probation live in greater Minnesota. Um, and there is some correlation between uh, often where people live and, and how they vote, which I think we could really, we could, uh, do a demography piece, and I think that there's a lot to dig into here. But I, I know Bob again, Carney wanted to say something on this point. I, I just briefly wanted to comment that I am in favor of restoring voting rights uh, for anybody as soon as they're released. That's all. That's perfect. Wow, round of applause for the shortest answer. Uh, good job. Uh, so, Leslie Davis, you're the, uh, I believe you're the last one that we haven't heard from. Do you, uh, yay or nay on restoring voting rights for felons at any point? You agree with Bob? Shortest answer. That, you're winning, yeah, this is good, all right. I love it, we're gonna be back out at the bar in a minute. So, um, all right, all right, so. Um, okay. Yeah, ski boat, I don't have Jimmy, uh, or uh, I don't have Jimmy Kimmel's budget, so. Um, <laughs> So there's proposed, there has been proposed legislation. Uh, I don't know if it's come up yet in this session, but there has been proposed legislation to basically eliminate same day registration here uh, in Minnesota and institute provisional ballots. So I have just a, I just have a, a parentheses here that says, Tane, explain provisional ballots. So bear with me while I try and say this, which is that if you showed up and for one reason or another, you weren't on your particular precinct's voter roll, uh, a, you would have to, instead of being able to say, have your next door neighbor say, yes, I know who this person is, they live where they say they do, and uh, fill it out that, and then be able to fill a real ballot out, you would get what's called a provisional ballot, where you would fill out your ballot, but it would be sort of like a make-believe ballot until you came back within a certain number of days and um, got that certified with some sort of uh, proof. So that legislation has been put forward in Minnesota. I am curious, is there anyone up here who would sign that legislation, who would actually support moving to provisional ballots? Aaron Murphy's standing up first, yes. Heck no. That's not the question. Hell no. How Tell about that? that's not the question. So I think we should, Minnesota's got great uh, election laws, right? Uh, we have worked very hard to make access to the vote uh, as liberal as possible, as usable as possible. And I think we should continue to do more. Let's register people when they turn 18. Let's do automatic registration. Let us stop any effort to do voter ID, right? Because that's voter suppression. Um, and no, hell no, to provisional ballots. So this is great because we've actually started to tick off a few other key things, which are uh, uh, heck no to voter ID and uh, heck yes to uh, automatic voter registration, that you're automatic, that would be the principle that you're automatically registered to vote. You don't have to go and do anything to do it. So I'm gonna try and pin everybody down on where they stand on those things. So Representative Walsh. No, I absolutely agree. I hope all of us know the treasure that we have that was just here a little bit ago and Steve Simon, the patriot that we've got who's made most of this happen. Minnesota, this access to it, Aaron's exactly right. We need to get people in. We need to talk about voting on days off. We need to make sure it doesn't disenfranchise people who are working swing shift or have their kids 
kids at daycare, all of those things we need to do. But let's be very careful of all the things we're doing. We don't have a voter fraud problem. We have access to the ballot problem. So anybody who flirts around with this voter ID stuff, that is the most disenfranchising thing we do. In Congress, they still won't reauthorize the Voting Rights Act, all of those things. As governor, it's about taking this message that this is the most important thing we do. And while we do lead the nation, we need to make it as easy as possible, get everybody to have their voice heard, because that's what it's about. So, ye so, so yes. Yes, uh, yes, second to yes. Representative Murphy. Yes, so um, I, I hate going down the line, but it seems like that's what's happening. So let's just keep going, yeah. Um, I agree with these, well, kind of with these guys. Um, <laughs> I believe in same-day registration. I'm sorry, that's how I did it. I showed my ID, I voted, and that's what I did. It was simple and it was easy. As per the provisional ballots, no, absolutely not. I think it's bull. I, we don't need them. Um, get rid of them. But as for same day, show your license, you're on the registration. How about automatic uh, voter registration? Yes. No, because what happens if they're taking someone else's identity? How do we know if they're not frauding that person? So I would say no right now. All right. Because there is fraud out there. There is a problem every day. And it's getting worse. Ever since Trump got wiped out, it the fraud has risen. And it can happen here in Minnesota as well. And what about, vo uh, what about voter ID? Uh, I think you have to have ID. You, do, you would support a voter ID bill that came to your desk as yes, governor? Yes, yeah. I would. Um, I, why shouldn't you have your ID? You have to show an ID to cast a check. You have to show your license to get on an airplane. I don't know who you are. No, I'm sorry. Oh, please, I, I just, uh, th there's plenty, there's a whole bar outside where we can do that kind of stuff. And so let's just say, let's the just, we have a little I'm bit more with the forum to keep going. Is that say I got a check in the mail and it was his name on it and I go to the bank and cash it and they say, I'm sorry, what was your first name? Tain, it's highly I, forgettable. Tain, well, th thank you for banking with us today, and I'm glad to cash your check. So he cashed the check, I walk away with his money. There's the fraud. So if you do automatic, and I'm signing up as someone else's Social Security, and you know today that how many people who have children are subjected to fraud? Lots, too many. So how do we know that someone else is not taking that away? Okay. I, yeah, well, that's very polite of you. So yes, Chris Wright. Uh, well, of, of course, we should, we should automatically register people to vote. And, uh, and also, they can always decline if they don't want to. So uh, I, I think that uh, it's uh, ridiculous to uh, do that. But you know, obviously, we don't, we don't want uh, uh, voter fraud either. But uh, I, there's not a whole lot of evidence that there is a whole lot of voter fraud going on anyway. So, so uh, a voter ID bill came to your desk, sign or veto? Uh, veto. All right. What if you got a lot of um, examples on a lot of voter fraud across your desk? Are you going to look at that or are you going to just ignore I'm it and throw say it in the garbage? Fake news. <laughs> it's not fake news. All right. All right. Uh, yes. So, all right. Um, again, with keeping it real, I'm going to kind of respond to some of the things that people said up here. Um, number one, automatic registration is fraud prevention. If I'm 17 and then I turn 18, I'm the same person. And if they didn't steal my identity when I was 17, it makes no difference when I'm 18. Um, that doesn't make a difference. Um, Voter ID, I have went to the poll and forgot my ID and had to figure out some kind of way to vote. So I am against voter ID. But at the same time, she is right. You have to prove some kind of way who you are. I'm standing here today because I'm different than all of these people. Nobody's going to talk to you about artificial intelligence. Um, nobody's going to talk to you about biometrics. The future of biometrics will happen. I don't care what you say. It's, it's already in the works. So as the governor, that's what I would do. Let's just go on and bring it out. That's what Snapchat is. It's face record recognition. When a lot of us go to work, we stick our finger on something. You can vote that, that way. No one has your, your pupil. 
And so I, I think that you're, are you starting to get into an area of um, uh, electoral security and uh, ballot security and some of those kinds of questions, yes. which- When we're born, they take your fingerprint. So that's not one of the things we as citizens are against. It's an individual thing. No one's gonna fight and say, I don't want nobody taking my fingerprint. You well, I, so I, I, so but actually, your we, fingerprint has already been taken. Well, let me just say, I, my my whole, my second, my second whole part of this is actually going to that security piece. But I do want to try and get uh, our remaining four candidates on on the line here in terms of. No uh, one has said Chris is wrong yet. Well, I'm going to ask in a moment which beverage you voted uh, in your ranked choice voting. So we'll see how that goes. The dark stuff. Uh, so, all right. Um, all right. Um, moving on down. So just to remind folks of where we're, what we're talking about here, uh, the initial question was about eliminating same-day registration. But then as a counter to that, we uh, noted the ideas of automatic voter registration when you turn 18 and this question of whether you support uh, voter ID. Okay. Hello? Yes. All right. What's up? You, what's my name, man? You remember my name? Yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, uh, you know, James. Uh, uh, okay, okay. I'm just checking on you, man. Um, but uh, I think that, no, I, I wouldn't support automatic registration. Some people are world citizens, which means they can't vote locally at times. Some people want to be sovereign. Some people want to be um, incognito. They don't want to be registered in that way. That's what the choice is about. Once we start picking pe choices for folks, just it's like almost like a draft. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You don't want to do that. Everyone has the right to participate in whichever way they see fit to. And But I do believe in same-day registration. I've seen it work wonders for campaigns. I've saw um, the knock and drags work well. I think that candidates who don't support that and don't support people having the right... Th this is my problem with the money. The Republicans have their base already. They don't have to participate, is what I'm saying. And so people come to you and say, well, I'm the Democrat, so you, you don't got another choice. I mean, I've actually heard that. Is there any money coming down for this? Or, or are you going to get people out to vote? Eh, we actually got the van. It's full enough, so we don't really need your vote on this. I mean, and so I saw it being used in that capacity. So my interest is in looking at the reform piece and figuring out where is that going that only one side is invested and the other side can push us that direction. So James, uh, the uh, the one last piece of this is the voter ID. Uh, I see the need for voter ID. I think some of it's generational. I think some of us, are, I mean, as uh, X's and Boomers are a little less trusting because we know there was there's we've seen a lot more in the past. I used the example earlier that serial killers is a movie thing to millennials to X's and Boomers. We knew they existed before the internet. So I know, so we have a different way that we look at stuff. I see the need for the voter ID, but I don't want it to be a bar barrier for anyone that gets to the polls and has to wait and be disenfranchised. I also believe in the absentee ballot. I also believe, I mean, I also believe in, you know, the different ways for people to vote. I believe we should diversify it and ask any party that doesn't believe in it, why? All right, uh, so since we'll keep going on down the line, uh, Leslie Davis, who, uh, thank you for bringing a sign, uh, just so that I can keep track of names. Uh, so, Leslie Davis. I agree with Bob. <laughs> you agree with Bob? We don't even know what Bob's, Bob, this is a big moment. We have no idea what Bob's gonna say. When I go in to vote, I make them look at my identification and match it to the book. I insist that he look at my identification when I vote. So, and you, so I'm, I'm taking that, that you think that that should be the law well, then. How does he know who I am, that I'm that person? Maybe somebody's coming in and voting under my name. So that's why I have and carry so, my, my identification. So, so you're saying yes to voter ID. What about automatic voter registration? I like that. You do like that. Yes to voter, automatic voter registration, yes to voter ID. Okay. Um, Bob, uh, speaking for... <laughs> <laughs> A couple of things. First of all, let, let's focus on what the main problem and the main issue is. We want to have honest elections, and we also want to make sure people vote. Uh, and the obvious problem that we have is that we're uh, so polarized that each base is actually getting out and they're voting more against the other party than for their party. So we, uh, we need to encourage 
voter participation. I don't think we have a problem in terms of honest elections. I'm open to evidence. If I see evidence of it, uh, I would change my view. But right now, uh, I think it, it's more important to make it as easy as possible for people to vote and to encourage people to vote. I want to comment briefly on what James is saying, too, in terms of kind of stereotyping uh, people that are taken for granted as uh, DFL voters. I am a Republican. Uh, I want to, uh, for example, get uh, better transit in Minnesota. We've got a lot of ideas on that, uh, but kind of run into this uh, uh, filter that, that is both an assumption and to some degree a reality. So you know, one of the reasons we need to have this okay. ranked choice voting is to let people vote more on the person and the ideas to break down those barriers. All right. Uh, thank you. And... Uh, Rounding out the end there. Okay, so Tina rounding Lee out the end. So the problem that we have is not voter fraud. I mean, all the evidence shows that this is a minuscule problem. And the problem that we really have is people being prevented from voting in various ways. So that's the problem we need to solve. And so automatic registration, I think you probably want to keep same-day registration just for people that have moved or whatever. But, um, and I, th I do think that biometrics and a lot of electronic stuff is going to change and make it easier to do this. But our goal has to be to let people vote and encourage them to vote, not the opposite over some made-up scare thing that we know is false. Okay, so that sounds like a very strong anti... I, I just want to get you on the... And so yes to automatic voter registration too? Yes, so... Yes. Yeah, we got it. Okay, so I'm just making sure we got this all on the line. So, uh, Mr. Quickly, Effort, yeah. I would just like to say that my company, Sub-Zero Collective, um, was responsible for the highest voter turnout in the non-presidential year since 1957 when we worked with the Children's Defense Fund and separately when we worked with the Wellstone Camp as well. Um, at that time, matter of fact, the underpinnings of our get out to vote strategies of 3,000 people in, in three months were those, those strategies actually were used at the Wellstone camp and featured in a few different books. So we, a lot of the underpinnings of Wellstone's get out to vote efforts at that time that moved to Mondale came behind the organization we were. So I don't want to leave people with the thought that I'm not with the voter turnout. I've actually, I'm actually a practitioner. I just want it more efficient. That's all. So I, I know you're, but I think that you're going to like my next question because uh, it's like going right to what you were talking about with biometrics and some other things. So uh, uh, that was you. That's why I'm pointing. Oh, okay. I'm the, I'm sorry. The, uh, yeah. So okay. so my next question is, and this is sort of a very wide open one, and I'm going to go back to sort of who wants to jump in first here. But uh, <laughs> how uh, how does how does this tie look on me? How secure? How secure do you think elections are right now in the state of Minnesota? And what measures do you think are needed to address those cons any concerns that you might have? I'm pausing because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to review newspaper articles to see if there were some things that I felt were unsecure. And I think the answer is, I think the Minnesota voting, hmm. I hate to agree with Tina. <laughs> when you vote, I love it. The, thank you, baby. <laughs> when you vote, the mechanism that we vote and use, the ballot system in Minnesota right now, I believe is secure. What I don't believe is secure is if me, and I've lived in Eden Prairie, I've owned a home in Eden Prairie, live in West Bloomington right now. But if myself moved to Minnetonka today and had to vote tomorrow, I don't think I would get to vote by saying, hey, here's my lease. I just moved here today. No, hold on. Because I've been in a situation when Obama was pre um, first time I got to vote for him in West Bloomington, I left my job as a teacher in the middle of the day to go vote. And I left something at home. And But I had something else in West Bloomington. I did not get to vote. I had to go and get another piece of paper, even though the one piece of paper I brought was sufficient enough. But when you have election judge type people that control their neighborhood, you have leniency, and that's why I was not with James on a man got to go back and get re-citizenship. 
you know, what is it? You okay. know what I'm saying? It's the same with slaves couldn't read, or I can only read certain letters, or my signature is an X, but my name is Seymour, and I don't know how to spell it, but master taught me X. And if you tell me, well, you got to write your name, and I say, ma'am, X is my name. On my birth certificate, for my daddy, his name is Lavelle. My middle name is Lavelle, but his name is L. V. Dot, because my uncle's name is L. Dot v. Dot. They were sharecroppers, and the generation before that, they were slaves. They didn't have names. They had initials or an X. In the United States of America, because of the Supreme Court, if a law doesn't get changed in the meantime, whatever it was 200 years ago is what it is. That's why Dred Scott never got to be a citizen. This is very powerful. I, 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 I'm, it's terrible to try and interrupt this, but Tina Liebling did what did stand up a moment ago, and so I want right. to give her a chance to jump in here. So, gosh, I almost forgot what I wanted to say because that was terrific. Thank you very much. I wish you could have gone on. I was really pretty spellbound by I that. I can go on. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. No, I just want to say about the, se the security piece. We are really lucky here in Minnesota because the real security challenge, let's face it, is hacking. Hacking, that's what we need to worry about right now. In Minnesota, we have a paper trail, so we are very lucky in that respect. And it's hard for me to know as a legislator exactly how secure we are, but I do think we have a very good Secretary of State. He's in the democracy business. We're all in the democracy business, right? But I think he's doing a good job, and I, you know, I hope that if he needs more resources and so on, that he will let us know, and was, that was the question, That right? was, and just specifically, is there anything you as governor feel like uh, these are things that I would take this action to do to try and secure from hacking, if that's the what you see as the biggest threat? Well, I don't think we're gonna have a hacking problem because we never went to the all electronic voting, so I think we were smart in that respect, unlike some other states that really do have a problem. But you gotta make sure that your um, that your voting system has enough resources. I mean, it takes a lot of work and uh, resources to have a good, secure, accessible voting system. So yes. we got to make sure that's well funded. Okay, uh, James Everett, and then we're going to come over here. Um, I'll go with saying first of all. Let me first address what what Mr. Seymour said. Um, one thing with me is that I didn't believe in getting people to um, come back and re-get their citizenship. My issue is is that I'm a Minnesotan. We got 90,000 jobs in the state. We have a great state. We have a lot of people loving each other, and there's not a lot of bad stuff happening on the individual, self, individual side. I'm saying that if we're moving forward, I'm not running for city council. I'm running for governor. I'm asking for the standard to be that we ask people, as, as Minnesota citizens, to consider whatever they, way that they need to be re-enfranchised, how to come back into society and be a contributor to the political process so that we're not fighting over the big dollar thing. So I want to say that first. Sure. My, one of my slogans, thank you very much. One of the slogans is enhancing, protecting, and preserving our way of life and, and, and resources. Um, we also have to speak to other places that are not doing well. I don't believe it's an issue for Minnesota, but I, I, watched, um, I watched Gore go off and do environmental stuff from the Democratic Party when he knew that there was ballot boxes in U-Haul trucks when Bush ran. We act like this never happened. We act like these things, but as Minnesotans, just because we do it better, we're like, well, we do it better. So we need to be the standard. And so when I speak on it, I want people here to be investing in the Minnesota way of life and culture. All right, very good. Uh, Representative Walls, yes. This sanctity of the ballot is fundamental to our democracy, and we all know what's going on with this. In Minnesota, again, and Tina's right, thanks to Steve Simon and others, and the paper trail, that's really important. But it's in the minds of the people. We know what they've done. They've undermined the legitimacy of our electoral process. That's what they're trying to do. That's why I joined 57 of my colleagues to bring the impeachment proceedings to the floor because of what they did with the Russia hacks to our uh, electoral system. Because what that's doing is that is the fundamental undermining of it. So as governor of Minnesota, we 
continue to protect our system, keep it safe with the paper ballots, but do the job of educating and restoring the faith of the people in that system. What they're trying to do is get you to believe that the election results don't matter, so voting doesn't matter, to reduce that participation. That is the most corrosive, cancerous thing to our democracy. And so for any of us to let any of that pass by, but to be very clear, there's 31 out of 1 billion votes cast that showed any type of in-person voter fraud. That is so minutely small, we should reduce it to zero if we tempt to, but all it is is planting that seed. So what we have to do is go out of our way to show the people how secure it is. We know it is, do more to show them that it's that way. And as governor, that's what exactly what I would do. Very good. Um, that's right. Hi. Uh, you know, I, I, I do think our, our system is secure. Uh, we do have card readers and uh, there's a paper trail. Uh, one thing that we do not get to, uh, which is not a secure thing, in our system, and that is the money vote. The, uh, the wealthy get to vote for the, you know, the wealth-backed candidates, but how do we get to vote for it? Well, we got the PCR. Well, that was great when it was uh, in introduced in 1990. Uh, it, it would be, well, we'd be having $97.28 uh, if it had been tied to inflation. I make the proposal that we have a, uh, uh, that every person in the state gets at least a $75 credit and that they don't have to wait uh, three weeks to get their uh, refund back from the state and uh, that uh, we can get, uh, give that money to the candidate or party of the, our choice and it's a credit that can be given through the state or even a, a debit card, thanks. So in the interest of time, I wanna ask, are there any security issues anybody up here sees that we haven't talked about that we should be talking about? So I, I think that it is important to recognize, and I've seen this uh, election after election last year in Morris, Minnesota. Uh, there were folks that were trying to interrupt students' ability to come in and vote, sending them away. And there are people that work at balloting places uh, across the state of Minnesota that are there uh, to protect that integrity of the people coming in to vote. And, and I'm grateful for that, and we've got to keep doing that, right, to make sure that no one gets turned away um, because they might not know the rules. Uh, I also know that in Minnesota, we do an audit after every election. The counties do that. So whether, not a recount, but just an audit to make sure that the results uh, that we've got are, va are validated and verified, which is important as well. Another statement to the way that we make sure our elections are full of integrity. And last, I wanna say, we have to hold on to the paper ballot, and there will always be efforts, right, to move us to an electronic kind of voting. The paper ballot is our proof point, um, and we have to hang on to those in the state of Minnesota. All right. <laughs> I'm seeing nodding, both Bob and Leslie agree with Aaron, good. Oh no, Bob, you're nodding to jump in, yes. I just want to reaffirm also the paper ballot is so, Yeah. the paper ballot is so key. It, I, I think a lot of people have said that, it's absolutely right. There is a huge, huge danger around the country of states that don't use it. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna shift gears here. This is something that I actually am very interested in. Um, there have been multiple efforts to create an independent process for redistricting in Minnesota. Uh, by a round of applause, do you support, uh, no, do you support independent redistricting? And if so, what might that look like? I'm gonna say no. And I'm saying no from the standpoint of globalism, okay? Um, if I was to ever run for president of the United States, I would make sure that my country from the day I become president, doesn't seek to take over another country. That's why we're in the problem that we have across the globe now, because countries take over other countries. So now with the state of Minnesota, okay, um, how I see if any changes of redistricting happens, it has to be a change of, of how construction happens or school districts, you know, but changing voting redistricting, there's no reason for that. It's not a tax thing, it's not an educational boundary, it's not um, a blood or crip thing, it, it, it's not a white or a black thing. So I would say like the people in Sasago, 
the people in Sasago shouldn't say, well, you know what? Well, we want a couple more feet of y'all city. If I can just push on, ask a little bit further on this. I mean, right now we have districts that are drawn uh, for the last several cycles, they've been drawn by courts because we've had divided government in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. In a lot of states, in Wisconsin, for example, you could uh, end up with uh, one party basically writing those. So this question is specifically to, mm -hmm. should there be an independent body that is outside of that uh, political process to draw the lines that we do already have? To, to make decisions in how people are going to vote in the future? There's no such thing as an independent body. That's a person making a decision for the for the rest of the people. Can you ask it a different way? Uh, so we have, so like I live in Senate District 62, which mm -hmm. is part of Minneapolis. Okay. And so at some point when we go through another census, they'll decide, okay, in order to have the same number of mm -hmm. senators uh, yeah. represent the same number of people, we have to draw the lines mm -hmm. in a way where there's the right number of people living. Somebody mm -hmm. has to draw those lines. Okay. Question is who should draw those lines? Should it be uh, people that are appointed by the governor and legislature? Should it be an independent body? Should it be the courts? I think Minnesota should get to how California does things. I forget what it's called, um, like when you put something on the ballot. I th even redistricting should be decided by the people that live in the district and or outside of the district. All right. That's so me personally. There's a bunch of folks who uh, want to jump in. Um, I, I, I'm going to give uh, Congressman Walls here, and then I'm going to come back over there. Yes. I'm going to speak about this because I live in it. The number one problem with our government right now is gerrymandered districts in the House of Representatives. That is fundamentally the issue. Nothing else. So I'm saying it on this. Chris, Chris is wrong. In 1972, 300 districts split ticket vote. They voted for the president of one party, a member of Congress from the other. There are now 12 districts in America that has a Democrat setting in one that voted for President Trump. What it did is it disincentivized compromise, it put people into camps where there was no reason to try and find common ground, and it is absolutely corrosive along with the campaign finance reform. Uh, Minnesota and the legislators, we have a kind of uh, a system that's a hybrid. We do it, then it ends up going to the courts afterwards. If the Republicans own all three branches of government here, they will change that procedure, and they will gerrymander Minnesota to ensure we don't have fair representation. As your governor, my commitment is to do it this way, judicial or non partisan citizen redistricting to ensure that there's fair elections, not fair for them, not lean towards Democrats, not lean towards Republicans. For all of you, if you're worried about any good news that's all come out recently, the court case in Pennsylvania with the Supreme Court refused to hear is the best thing to happen for democracy in the last year. So, so just to try, and I did promise James that I would go, but let me, let me just get one piece on this. So you, yes, we've had it sort of gone through the courts, but that's because we've had divided government. If you're a governor in 2021, a Democrat DFL governor, and you have a whole, it's possible you could have a whole DFL legislature. You're saying you would still put Absolutely. it into a Absolutely. nonpartisan process. Absolutely. All right. Only fair way to protect democracy. All right, uh, James Everett. My issue comes down to um, I saw redistricting work very interesting in my neighborhood. First of all, let's start with gerrymandering. Okay, that's the major issue on the table. I've watched different parties write. I watched them draw lines around opposite candidates' houses. I watched the, the, the Green Party get nixed out of the whole major party status and stuff because the redistricting, they would redistrict right around people's houses. I watched them use the money that was supposed to go for the dilapidated warehouse district of downtown Minneapolis North Loop to revitalize it and then redistrict downtown almost into its own castle and city. I know that 60% of North Minneapolis is youth under the age of 25. You only have to be 18 to vote, but if we have 10 ad people at the address that are registered voters, that means that in a strong city council, weak mayor system, it only takes 2,500 people to get someone elected to city council. If they get elected enough times, they become president, which in turn means that you have to dis disenfranchise those votes per house. And that's the reason for the incarceration is to take away people's right to vote in North Minneapolis. I believe in redistricting should be more about, we also, I believe people should be able to de-annex. I believe that North Minneapolis should be like South St. Paul. I believe if you don't have the interest of your city, you should be able to apply to de-annex or create your own township as well. So that needs to be a discussion on that, and I do support independent. So independent board that does redistricting is what you're... you're it has to be. Okay. We've, seen, we've seen it go other ways, and it's not working. I have Erin Murphy, and then I will come back over here. So I lived through this here in Minnesota in 2011. 
And we don't have a hybrid system in Minnesota. It is the legislature's responsibility to draw the map. When that map is vetoed, it goes to the courts, which has happened for many, many years in Minnesota, with the exception of 1994, when then new Governor Carlson wasn't quite sure of the pocket veto rules. And the map that was drawn by the legislature became law. I think it should go to an independent body. Absolutely. I watched what happened when a partisan body drew a map. Um, and it was not in the interest or by the criteria that we set for the map drawing. Um, I watched what happened in St. Paul when Rondo was divided. And gratefully, when the court did it in this last election, they put Rondo back together again, which is a criteria we should follow. An independent body will be will be responsible to the, pe the people. They will be responsible to the good of our power. And when our power is drawn fairly, um, we have then the say in the elections. So yes, to an independent body to make sure that our democracy is vibrant in the state of Minnesota. So, Chris Wright, um, yeah. but I just want to try and put, so, so far it seems like we're, we're in large agreement here. So if we're in agreement, that's, I'm hoping maybe there's something to add or, Very, yeah. very much so. Okay. I, uh, on this issue, I've done my homework and I ate my Wheaties. Uh, yes, we need an independent, uh, uh, you know, uh, unbiased uh, uh, board to do this. But, uh, you know, I've also found uh, that there was a open source program that they could use, perhaps, called Auto Redistrict. Simply open a shape file, load in the census and election data, and hit go. And that takes away all the bias right from the, right from the beginning. As some people in the audience are murmuring, someone writes the program, but... Um, That's what I yeah. meant by somebody, an independent party person that gets to decide that's not even living in there. They are a controller. Independently doing redistricting does not do anything for the people that live in a district because they still don't decide. Can I just... How would you want redistricting to happen then? Like I said... Um, Propositions, that's what I meant to say. That's what California does. We can put it on the ballot. Or me personally, man, I would be done with redistricting. There's no more reason to do that. Somebody tell me, why should you get to cut into the city I live in? Or why should I get to cut into the city you live in? For what reason anybody up here tell me okay so no, the population grows but why do you get some of my vote what this is a this is a the, i promise to no what i hold on yes, let me yeah, get yeah. you i live in eric paulson district right i am not mad every time he wins i know for a fact why he wins because the people out there it's a tax thing and they're scared for the taxes to move too far away from where the Democrats might take it or change some of those things. My personal thing is, if enough Democrats have not moved into the Eric Paulson neighborhood to make the change that they need and want, leave that dude alone. And, and that goes for any and everybody. And I, and I know uh, what I'm saying is, is upsetting you guys. But the truth is the truth. Same with the black neighborhood. If, if we are voting the way we live and then some more people move into our neighborhood, that vote changes. So Tina Liebling has been very patiently waiting, and so has Bob Carney. And so I want to make sure that they get a chance. And it's back over here then. I'm going to go first here so Bob can say he agrees with me, right? <laughs> Okay, so um, we do have the principle of one person, one vote, and it's never perfect, but we, that's why we have to redistrict to try to keep that as much as we can. And of course, it's becoming somewhat of a cliche, but of course, we have to allow voters to pick their leaders, not the other way around, which is what happens if we let redistricting be done in a partisan way. And uh, we have been through that in Minnesota, and it's really pretty ugly the way it, it can happen. Why so does redistricting need to be done? Well, because we have to have districts, and which I can explain later, but yeah. I want to give Representative Liebling a chance to answer the question. Right, so we should have an independent body. We absolutely should, and I think we also need recourse to the courts just in case because, you know, this is, you know, it's true. Everyone has their bias. We have to pick an independent body and make sure it's balanced and so on, and, you know, no system's ever perfect. So I would keep the courts in there as a final resort, but... The problem ha with having the courts do it in the first place is that the courts really don't have the expertise, and it really does take expertise to do this and do it well. And we need to make sure that we, you know, have 
districts that are drawn in such a way that we have real opportunity for people to make change. Okay, Jenny wrote, or sorry, Bob. Bob again, Carney, and then Jen, uh, Jenny uh, wrote, sorry. And I agree with some. Uh, <laughs> but it, let, let's take a look at what the real problem is. Uh, we have a huge divide in Minnesota, and it's true around the country too, between rural and urban. And as a matter of fact, in, Minis in Minneapolis and St. Paul, the core cities, uh, no Republican uh, got more than 30% of the vote for a legislative race. Uh, I was the highest vote getter uh, for Republicans in Minneapolis for a state senate last time around, 18%. It's really pathetic. And so really the problem goes back as much to division in our society as uh, to redistricting. It cannot be corrected at the state legislative level because of redistricting, because of this extreme split. Now, just in terms of how to solve it, either a judicial or an expert body is certainly preferable to the legislature. Okay, so independent body, Jenny Rhodes and then Leslie Davis, but Jenny Rhodes wanted to jump in here. Um, yeah, I agree. It yeah, just right in there. Okay. Um, I agree. It should be independent. We can't control who's going to move into the district, who's going to run for that district. You, you, you can't predict the future. So to be the fairest thing of all, but it goes by census. I mean, how many people are moving out? How many people are moving in? Who's, who's going to run for election? The best way to do it is have an independent party because going to court, they're just going to mess it up and make it worse than what it is. We need to have an independent because we can't control the future. So the best way to do it and to be fair is to have an independent person that come and does the redistricting. So maybe with the help of the program. So Leslie Davis down here. Yep. I just wanted to address Bob's concern about the Republicans getting the amount of votes they get in the Twin Cities. It's not because of redistricting or anything else. It's because they don't have any good ideas and they're mean spirited. Wow. All right. This is um, I. I will just I say. I will pass on a response. <laughs> I want to see the Bob and Leslie comedy hour. Like, I would totally go to this show, uh, the two of you together. Um, so last question of the evening, uh, and actually it goes to what we were just talking about. Um, and this is sort of a, a free for all in some ways, but I, I'm excited about this because I think it's actually something super important. So um, what, what's the correct role for Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota state government, to ensure a fully inclusive, honest, and accurate census count? Uh, both nationally and here in Minnesota. And what can you do as governor to help uh, make sure that a census happens accurately and fairly here in Minnesota? Um, Christopher Seymour running for governor 2018. And one of my first, the first promise in my campaign promises is to fully fund education. And so to use education as a tool. Um, most people who have parents, after I say this, I'm going to ask you to ask the question again. Most people who have parents have, I mean, people who have children, they go to school. And so we can get numbers from, from that. But please ask the question again. What is the role for Minnesota state government, and if you were governor, mm -hmm. for ensuring a full and accurate census here in Minnesota? Still through the... We got to go by districting, yeah, right? So, but the truth is there is no way to do that. There is no way to do that. Some people don't want to fill out the census thing. Keep it the way it is. It's voluntary. There's no rhyme or reason to find out what time everybody's going to be home, so we can't make everybody stay home. The only way to make sure we have a 100% full census data is for everybody to get paid to stay home and be where you need to be so everybody can fill out their census. The only other way to do that is when your kid goes to school, because if your kid don't go to school, you go to jail at some point in time. Um, okay. That's the closest way to do it, is okay. through the school system. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna give, she was grabbing the microphone first, so uh, just as a reminder, the question here is, we're about, in, if you're governor, if you're the next governor, you will be governor when Minnesota has a census. So what, if any, role do you and the state of Minnesota have in assuring a full and fair and accurate census? 
Well, there could be a couple ways. One is when you file your taxes. Everybody works, and you got to include their right. their they end. Taxes. No, they don't. But if you don't file taxes, but you also, as an independent, get more like. If someone has five kids, they have, they mark them down as independent. And then how many people get Social Security in the state of Minnesota? So you add those two together, taxes with, indep with independent people and how many have Social Security, you're going to get a more accurate number than going from door to door and having someone hope to God they fill that census out and send it in. Please let me help you out because I the reason why I'm running, I'm not a politician. I need these politicians to ask answer these questions correctly. Please ask them, do you believe there is a 100% way to get a census versus how would you do it? Because I can make up something, but... That doesn't mean that it's possible. The question wasn't how to, there, nobody talks about getting 100% uh, census. It's getting the most accurate and the most fair census that we possibly can. And so that is the question. And it's completely fair for somebody to say, maybe that's not the role of the Minnesota governor. That's why I'm asking this question to see if these folks who are running for that office think that it is part of their potential job. So is it part of the job if you were to be governor? And if so, how would you do it? James. Um, I think that the process is going well as it is. There's some people that don't want to be counted, as he, as Mr. Seymour did say. Um, some people look at it as a way to target them. Again, I told you North Minneapolis is 60% youth under age of 25. For voter, for people to attack the voter base, there is very easy when you know how many people are registered at the addresses and things. So I think that it's a very personable thing to get out in the neighborhood and talk to people, and we just take the numbers that we get because obviously there's a reason they don't want to be a part of the process. We, excuse me, we need to figure out what that problem is and how we bridge that. Because people are not participating because they feel disenfranchised as it is already. And so I think that's something we need to think about is that everyone doesn't want to be counted. I don't think there's a more accurate way. Um, but I'd like to take a couple of my seconds to say that um, I want to give a shout out because we've been so heavy. I want to give a shout out to Uptake. I want to give a shout out to M I mean, SPNN. Um, public access has been a major part of democracy for me, and I have to say that because it's given me a voice across the state and allowed me to be in this position. And so I wanted to say that before we go forward with all the other stuff. So I don't think there's an accurate way to do it. You just have to work with who wants to be a part of it or fix the problem. Okay. Um, Representative Murphy? So the census is uh, largely a federal issue. Uh, but it, well, I would use my voice as the governor to make sure that everyone is counted. Uh, if I get a letter to my house that says it's time to fill out the census, I'm going to fill it out. But that's not true for everybody. And if we want to make sure that everybody's counted, we have to recognize that there are family structures that are different, that are people sometimes afraid to come to the door if someone's coming to their door. Um, someone who's disabled might not easily be able to be counted. Um, someone who's a victim of a domestic assault might not want to answer the door. Someone who's afraid of ICE might not want to answer the door. Um, so I think it is important that we recognize that the census is our way. It's the very fundamental way to make sure we know how many people are here, um, to make sure that every voice is counted. And I will use my power as the governor to make sure that we're not using some sort of rounding process, some sort of um, estimation process, but that we're actually digging in and making sure that everyone who wants to participate, right? I get that part, but everyone gets counted. Tina Liebling, and then I'll come back over here. Okay, I noticed you call me, you call Representative Murphy. Sorry, Representative, Representative Tina. I've okay. been going back and forth yeah. with everybody. Okay. I just, I can't, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I don't think there's a really direct role for the governor in the census and the accuracy of the census. However, this is an area, you know, traditionally, traditionally, we've undercounted immigrants. That's a serious, serious problem. We need to be able to count. And so I'm really worried that this time it's going to be even worse because people are in such fear because of what's going on with the Trump administration. So all the things that we need to do, first of all, are the things that we need to do anyway to try to give immigrants to our state the feeling that they're welcome and that we're going to protect them to the degree that we possibly can, including driver's licenses, for goodness sakes, for people who are undocumented. So all of that stuff needs to happen. And then the governor needs to use the bully pulpit to talk to people about the importance and why they need to be counted. That's really a leadership issue that I would love to engage in, because it's super important. Everyone needs to be counted, and people really be, need to be reassured that they are not going to be targeted as a result of 
being part of the census. And right now, I can okay. well understand why people are worried about that. OK, uh, I did have, I'm going to just to be fair, I'm going to just say Tim. Uh, Tim Walls, uh, no title. Uh, Tim Walls, uh, and then we'll go back over to. Well, Tina was exactly right on that part of it, and, and Aaron was too. It, it's predominantly a federal issue because it is required by the Constitution that we need to do it. It is critically important. It's one of the most important things that we do because all kinds of things flow from that, um, whether it is federal aid, um, whether it is how we deliver health care. And I can tell you, in Minnesota, here's the deal. We are on the bubble. If we do not get this right, or some of you get frisky and have more children, we're going to go from eight to seven in. Uh, we're going to go from eight to seven in federal representation. That is a huge loss of voice for m nearly 800,000 people in this state. What the governor can do is once again reassure that the system is safe, talk about the responsibility, constitutional responsibility about being there, but then make the case like so many of these things are, is building a consensus that this is in the best interest of your community. If you are able to get to a certain level and become a metropolitan statistical area, it changes how federal aid is allocated to your community. It changes how we make decisions about community and public health. So one of the roles, the most important state role, is reassuring people that this matters and it improves our country and strengthens it. And, and making the case of this, the founders understood how important mm -hmm. it was going to be to make sure. And, and Aaron had a great point. Make sure the enumerators who are doing the counting are culturally sensitive and trained. The state can help with that. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to go to Bob and then back over to Chris. Yes. So Mr. Carney. Yeah, of course, we've covered that the it is a federal issue. The, the Constitution requires an enumeration of persons. It does not require an enumeration of citizens. It's very clear about that. And so we really do have to focus on enumerating persons. And as a Republican, I've just got to throw one more piece into this. Uh, let's uh, think about counting the unborn. <laughs> That's shame. All right, um, Chris. Okay, well, I think uh, uh, Aaron, uh, Tina, and uh, Tim have spoken well about uh, it's a federal responsibility, and we, we do need to make sure that we keep our representation uh, in Congress and so on. Uh, but I, I think, uh, uh, based on what we've been talking about here at this, I, I'd like to diverge from uh, the, the question and point out that... Uh, you know, uh, we need to stop uh, prohibit uh, lobbyists from bundling campaign contributions. We need to we need to end this uh, uh, the uh, prohibit uh, fundraising during legislative hours. Uh, you know, how about uh, that we uh, uh, you know that we allow uh, that we mandate free or reduced cost advertising on public television and, and radio? How about uh, well, we own the public airwaves. How about uh, on, on private television, too, and take away their license if they won't let us do it? Uh, how about use of, of public buildings and stadiums for, for rallies and things like that to uh, hold our campaigns, maybe reduce cost mailing and so on? Anyway, uh, go to votewright.org and let's get growing. All right, thank you so much, Chris Wright. Uh, so because this is our last question, whether you have something to say about the census, I mean, we've, we've diverged once. I want to make sure that I'm giving uh, uh, Leslie Davis and, and uh, Jenny uh, Rhodes here and James Everett, uh, if you all want to have something. Yeah. I'm going to go that route. Um, I saw my biggest problem is becoming a candidate. I've been doing the work so long, I either glaze, I go all the way over the top, or I miss people right in the middle. I'm trying, I, my thing is, is that you see I have the intellectual capacity to do such. You look at this book here, The Compassionate Rebel Revolution. I mapped out in 2011 what we would do now. My chapter's called The Governor of Hip Hop. It's written by Burt Burlow, and it's, this is my cabinet for governor. We already wrote this. The people in this book are the cabinet of, people, of the people that I would bring into committees. There's a lot of thought that went into my campaign. Vote James. ForGov.com is my website, but check in with me. I'll be here also, and anybody who wants to talk later on, we can go um, next door to Lake Monster. I've already talked to them about us having further conversation. I couldn't drink before this, but afterwards, <laughs> though, come party with your boy, okay? Okay. Did you want to jump in? Okay. Yeah, let's party, man. There's too much liquor around here. Right. Do you want to grab the microphone? So, 
I'm going to give Jenny Rhodes here a chance. Yeah, I, I do agree with these guys. The census is very important in to get in federal funding. Um, so we do need to be um, get on the ball and get a good, accurate system going to make sure that if we're not right on the money, then we're pretty darn close because those federal fundings have helped states a lot. And Tim Wells is probably knows well that how much funding from the government, the federal government is important and we need that. So I'm all for getting the census correct. All right, thank you so much. And I do wanna give Leslie Davis a chance. If you wanna agree with Bob on, you know, <laughs> votebobcarney.com, uh, that's- No, I'd have to ponder that subject a little more, but Mr. Walsh made some good points because a lot of the money distribution has to do with the census and things like that. So when you start talking money, now you're coming into my arena. But he made sense on some of the things that he said. Okay, with that, um, uh, I have two last things to do. First off uh, is, uh, it's my job to announce uh, the actual winner of our uh, taste testing that we were doing outside. So hopefully, we, I know. So hopefully everybody uh, tasted one of, or all of the beverages, and it's been long enough now that you're okay to drive back home. But uh, so. <laughs> Uh, if not, you can hang out for a while, talk more to the candidates. But uh, we had a, a series of different uh, cocktails and beer tastings and cider tastings, and we did rank choice voting to see which one uh, was people's favorite. So yeah, it's very exciting. So uh, first in the first round, and I'm so sorry, I, I this is uh, not. I'm having a hard time reading this. Which was the was it Utipsis? Uh, how do you pronounce it? What? Utapels, the Utapels. Well, now this is anticlimactic because the Utapels was eliminated. So, um, <laughs> sorry. Utapels, though, great stuff. So, uh, in the second round, uh, the wine was eliminated. Uh, in the third round, oh. Um, in the third round, uh, Third Street was eliminated, which meant that when we got to round four, with 65% of final round ballots, Sociable Cider Works was the winner. Big round of applause, Sociable Cider Works. So. Uh, so with that, I want to say a tremendous thank you. So uh, first off, I, I mean, we got into a lot of things here. This is, I mean, you know, I, I know that we, we heard a lot tonight. Uh, this is a very challenging set of issues for anybody who uh, dives into these things. And to put yourself up in front of a whole group of people and have some crazy improv comedy guy throwing questions at you uh, about everything from the census to voting rights to uh, how we should draw district lines is uh, a, a good ask of the people who are, are running for governor. And it's something that I very much appreciate all of these folks did tonight and took the time to share their views with us and speak intelligently and competently about all of these issues. So uh, a big round of applause. Thank you for all of our candidates. So Aaron Murphy, Tim Walls, Jenny Rhodes, Chris Wright. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm choking all of a sudden. I didn't even have a drink. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jenny Rhodes, uh, Chris Seymour, James Everett, uh, Leslie Davis, Bob Again Carney, and Tina Liebling. So, one more time, a round of applause for all of our candidates here. And a big round of applause for all of our partners for uh, SPNN, for Fairboat Minnesota, for all of our partners. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I'm sure. So uh, Sociable Cider Works won, so I think that that means that they're automatically served at the inauguration, right? Yeah, so all right, good job. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.